Okay, so what are we, 48 hours or so out on this Thursday morning from the start of a brand new Premier League season, which can mean only one thing. That is about 47 hours out from the deadline for your first Fantasy Premier League match week. Delighted to say we are joined by Joshua Bull. Uh, for Fantasy Premier League players, you will recognise his name from clicking into the overall standings last season, scrolling all the way up to the very top and noticing his name up at the very top all season to the point where he won FPL last year. Joshua, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks for asking me on. Cheers. The one thing that really struck me from particularly the last season of Fantasy Premier League is that we are now operating in an entirely different sphere to how we were five, ten years ago. To see yourself up at the top there, somebody uh, who was a part of the Oxford School of Maths, I think, to see Grandmaster Magnus Carlsen up there, it definitely feels like a lot more people are investing uh, a lot of their brains into FPL and winning this thing. Yeah, so I, I do wonder how much of it is a kind of um, confirmation bias almost. You know, we we see me as a mathematician and Magnus as a chess player, but there's a whole load of other people that are at the top of the table as well. Um, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of them don't have a, a maths phone in their body. Yeah, it definitely seems that that is one thing that we look at now. And perhaps the easy thing to say is, oh, so we must start using statistics and we must start looking deep into the numbers and mining data to win this thing. But I'm sure from your perspective, it has been as much to do with the eye test as it is to do with stats. So yes and no, I would say. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not a big stats person, really, even though I'm a, I'm a mathematician. I don't spend a lot of time kind of diving into really detailed um, kind of player comparisons. But at the same time, I'm not actually very good at football. <laughs> so when it comes to like watching matches, I'm quite aware of my own weaknesses there. But like, I'm, I'm not particularly good at actually watching a match and saying, oh, they look like a great fantasy football asset. Um, but I think that actually really helped me because it meant that when I started taking the game seriously, I was really trying to get a wide sample of opinions. So I would try and get as much information as possible from as many different people. And if 99% of people are all saying, oh, um, you know, Jamie Vardy is looking like a great pick at the moment or something, that maybe means something different to if 50% of people are saying that or if it's just a really small minority. So I think I, I was kind of crowdsourcing the eye test, if you like. Who are you talking to? Um, so I, there's some very active kind of online communities around fantasy football. So particularly on, on Reddit, there's an entire subreddit dedicated to fantasy Premier League. Um, and there's also a, a really active Twitter community. And there's a lot of kind of cross-pollination of ideas. So you do sometimes see the entire community seems to captain a Brighton defender or something, and everyone seems to think it's a good idea. And you have to kind of take a step back from that and say, well, how much of this is, is just a kind of uh, bubble of, of what the people in this particular community are, are kind of um, saying among themselves and how much of it is actually sensible. That's, that's really interesting because one of those things you could add to that list is the fantasyfootballscout.co.uk message boards, which I guess if you log on there any Saturday morning, 0.5 of a second, you're onto a new page. It is just a constant stream of information to the point where these forums have become rather large where bandwagons can almost develop in the conversations that occur in these forums. So how do you have those conversations while also encourage your own independent thinking to ensure that you are still being relatively differential with some of your picks? Yeah, I, I, think, I think for me, um, getting that diversity is, is really key. And trying to, trying to look at every opinion and saying, is, is this a, a bubble? You know, is this a bandwagon? Or is this actually something that, you know, if I went and asked um, you know, one of my friends who's uh, a really big fan of that club, would they recognize that as being a sensible thing? Or would they say, you're, you're completely crazy? And I think just having that kind of critical eye, you know, analyzing the, the information that's coming in and, and being a bit critical of it, not just taking it at face value, is really key to that. Because in, in hindsight, a lot of the people on these bandwagons say, what were we thinking, captaining a Brighton defender in that double game week? That was, you know, that sounds crazy. And when you take a step back, it's, it, it feels like a bad idea. So I think if you're, 
if you're looking at, at someone on your team and you're thinking, hey, if I showed this to my friends, would they say, oh, you're completely mad? Or would they say, oh, yeah, actually, that could be, could be a good choice? Um, Joshua, just to ask you clearly, um, I know you, I know you say it's confirmation bias, and you know some some of these things are down to luck as well. But the reality is, your bulldozers team earned over two thousand five hundred points last year, so we're going to mine you for any information we can get. Um, I mean, some people's policies are choose a few expensive players and stick with them. Uh, and I know I've I've seen you speaking before about how expensive is good. The more expensive a team is, the reality is the better it does. So. Do you kind of move away from this idea of trying to spot a, a bargain player and trying to fill your team with, with as many expensive players as you can, I guess? No, so I, I think there's a, a really important balance to hit there. So we kind of know, looking at the season ahead, who the players are that are going to score the most points. You know, We don't know who's, who's going to edge it, but it's a pretty safe bet that people like Mo Salah or Kevin De Bruyne will be, will be up there. So we sort of know that those are the players we want in our teams. And, and those are probably the first players that everyone starts to look at is who, who are the kind of premium picks that I can put in here. Um, but the problem that you get is if you just try to load up with most expensive players, then obviously you're left with, with cheap players that um, aren't necessarily even, even going to get any game minutes. So I, I think for me, there's a really important balance where I want to have just sort of um, one or two really expensive players that I know are going to do well. And I want to keep them in my team for the whole season and let the variance kind of work for me. So they might have a bad week when I'm not expecting them to, but they might have a good week when I'm expecting them to do badly. So I don't want to be switching them in and out all the time. Um, but then at the same time, I think you need to find those, those kind of differential picks at the cheaper price points. And for me, it's much easier to find players around sort of seven, eight million that are going to mm. score lots of points than it is to try and find those in the sort of four or five million mark. So I would say you're, you're better off having uh, fewer of the really big name players and, and having a much more balanced team. Uh, having said that, you know, different people do it completely differently. So. Yeah. There are different methods, I guess. But uh, one other thing that comes into it, and it's probably a little bit different this season, is, is the home and away balance. So... Uh, I guess mathematics will tell us that generally home teams have a, a slight advantage. I know it's stranger this season with, with, with no fans for the start of the season anyway, but uh, is that something you think about? Is that a large part of your, your thinking when you look at fixtures and, and important players that home advantage is, a, is an, a really crucial thing to think about? Yeah, so it, it was something that I kind of had half an eye on last season. Um, so since finishing the season, a lot of people have asked me about um, sort of the maths of fantasy football and whether I used maths. Um, so I actually gave a, a public lecture for University of Oxford that I work for um, on Tuesday night, where I did a lot of, of these kind of mathematical analyses. And the really surprising one to me was, was how important that home form is. Um, and actually, there, there is a definite bump there. You know, you, you are better off picking a home player. And I think that applies um, even when there's, there's no fans, I would say, because there's, there's all kinds of factors that go into why might a player be better off at home? Well, you know, they, they live there for a start. They're not having to drive halfway across the country. So I don't think it's necessarily going to be a big problem that there's no fans in the stadium um, other than for entertainment purposes. You know, I mm -hmm. think the home away difference will still be there. That's very interesting. Uh, like, I guess what people are interested in as well is the, the metrics that you might use to actually de determine who goes into your team. And I'm sure there are a multitude of them. But one of the things I've definitely seen more chat about over recent seasons has been your points per million. So, for example, your uh, 4.5 defender from Crystal Palace getting a clean sheet is a far more valuable thing than Trent Alexander-Arnold getting a clean sheet. Do you break it down to points per million and actually decipher who is going to be the best value for your team when you're getting the most out of your 100 million at the start? Yeah, so I, I definitely don't explicitly do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the main problem with that is that um, you don't know how many points each, each player is going to score. Um, which, you know, seems like a really uh, obvious thing to say. But if it was, if, if it was uh, the case that we knew that at the start of the season, it would be easy to pick the best team. Um, 
but obviously what makes it an interesting game is that what people have done in the past doesn't necessarily reflect what they're going to do in the future. So I don't kind of explicitly calculate that sort of statistic, but it's definitely something in the back of my mind of, you know, um, if I just pack my team with Salah and Aubameyang and Mane, um, that's getting very expensive. And I guess those are the trade-offs that, that most managers are, are probably thinking about. But I think just having an eye on it as, as a kind of slightly more explicit thing is, is probably useful. It's not exactly advanced mathematics, but the price rises are probably as complex as you're going to get into when it comes to FPL. How close do you watch them? Are you on every single night? On Is it FPLstatistics.com who keep an eye on them, seeing who's going up, who's going down, and it's a day-to-day thing? Yeah, so right. I would say, particularly at the start of last season, I definitely was. Okay. Um, and I think there's a very clear link between um, you know, having, having an expensive team, having a high team value, and having lots of points. But the question is, which way does that link run? And presumably, um, you know, I don't think that just chasing team value is a good strategy. But I think if you get on players that are doing well, everyone buys them and your team value goes up. So it, it, it feels to me that the, the effect runs the other way around. It's not that you need the high team value in order to get the points, but you get the high team value from having points. That said, at the start particularly, it's probably a good indication of the types of player that, that are on the way up. So particularly when everyone has the same budget in week one, you don't want to get left behind on, on those uh, team value changes because you're very quickly going to find that you can't afford to bring in the players that you want to, the players that are really finding form. So particularly at the start of the season, I was paying a lot of attention and not making transfers because of the price changes. But I would say if there was a transfer, I was thinking I was 75% likely to make and I saw that the price change was going to happen. That would probably make me um, come to a decision on it much faster. Uh, clearly, the issue of captains is is an important one, given the doubling of points for those players. Um, and I've heard different people adopting the, the policy that you know there's no point in picking a captain that's worth less than, say, eight point five nine million pounds on on the on fantasy. So, is that a policy you adopt that there's only a real point in, in in picking a captain who is one of the more expensive players? Like, say, for example, Salah is at home this week uh, this weekend. He's against one of the newly promoted times uh, teams in Leeds. So. We, should captains be only the expensive players, do you think? I, I think generally, yes, to be honest. Um, the reason for that being that you're expecting those expensive players to do better on average. That's why they're so expensive. So there will always be players um, like Danny Ings from last season, I think is a really good example, where he was um, priced well below that, that limit and obviously was having a great season and price was going up but he still wasn't above that kind of premium threshold. So that doesn't make him a bad captain choice. But if I was torn between um, him and somebody like Mo Salah, say, or Kevin De Bruyne, with an equally good fixture, I would probably go for that expensive player just because I'm expecting them to get more points in the long run. And that, you know, I think that's, that's what you're looking for from the captain. Mm. Uh, just you mentioned that the talk you you, you gave uh, for, uh, online for Oxford uh, yesterday, and I, I saw a clip from it, and it was quite interesting. I found that play, people maybe look at the shiny thing over there when they're trying to make transfers week in week out, uh, and they like to choose players who have played previ- uh, well the previous week um, and sign them up rather than concentrate on getting rid of the underperforming players that they have. So. Uh, do you think people should maybe t- take more of a focus on getting rid of the, the deadwood in their team as opposed to trying to find the, the star players who've been, who've been playing well in the previous weeks? Yeah, definitely. Um, so that, that was something which really surprised me, just how stark the difference was when I, when I made that model. Um, it was really emphatic that you score better by getting rid of, of players that you think are underperforming rather than bringing in players that you think are performing well. So that doesn't mean that you should just get rid of somebody and, and bring in somebody else that you don't particularly like the look of. But, you know, if there's a, a, a premium player that just scored a hat-trick and is worth 10 million, and there's a, um, you know, a, a cheap midfielder that is in pretty good form, but like they're not going to be as explosive as that expensive player, but they're only 5 million. It's, you're better off looking at your team and saying, 
well, the only player I've got here that's really underperforming is a 7 million midfielder. So rather than bring in that expensive replacement for somebody that I actually kind of want in my team anyway, um, I'll bring in the, the slightly worse value option, but that actually improves my team overall. So I think the main reason for that is because when you're looking at transfers, you want that player to sit in your team for some length of time. So you want them to be a player that's going to do well over the next few weeks. Whereas if you're just looking at a player's recent form and then saying, oh yeah, I need to bring them in, and you're comparing them with um, your premium choice that hasn't mm. scored a hat-trick last week, well, all that's going to happen is that when it's, you know, if, if you're selling Mo Salah to bring in Kevin De Bruyne, well, immediately what will happen is Mo Salah will get his hat-trick and Kevin De Bruyne will blank, and you'll think, oh, I should have should have left it there. For sure. It's points chasing and it rarely uh, works out too well. But what I find very interesting here is that uh, your way of thinking is just a really logical way of thinking about fantasy football. You almost have a philosophy uh, when it comes to fantasy football that is very clear and rigid and your thought process seems to be consistent every week. Like I, I, I assume I'm correct in saying that. Whereas some people might say somebody involved in the Oxford School of Maths won Fantasy Premier League must have had all the statistics uh, to his hand. But it seems that it's it's logic as much as anything else. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know how well I actually did at, at sticking rigidly to that philosophy. Um, Can you give us examples on that? But, yeah, I, I guess, um, well, pro- probably the best example of that is Jamie Vardy, who I had a feeling from the start of the season that he was, he was going to do well. So he was in my team early on, which was, was great when he started doing well, you know. Um, but then actually I held on to him all the way through that goal drought that he had. Um, and really, if I was being kind of um, a, bit more, a bit more clinical about it, I would have said, well, actually, his, his form has really, really dropped. And at the moment, he's the deadwood in that team. And he's the player that I should be transferring out to bring in someone else. Whereas I kind of had him in my head in the, the other category of, oh, well, he's, he's a premium player. He's, he's going to bang in the goals next week. Oh, it'll be next week. It'll be next week. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there I was kind of um, looking at him a bit too fondly in terms of what he'd done for me early on in the season. That's very interesting. What was the most heart-stopping moment in winning FPL 2019-2020? Oh, that's a good question. I think, so on, on the last day, um, I was kind of in, in and around the, the kind of top three or four. And so I knew that I had a, a chance to win it from there. Um, and I, I went off, I, I actually went for a run. So I completely missed the first half. You know, I made my transfers, looked at all the team news and thought, right, yeah, I, I need, to, need to go out. So I went, and went off for a long run, came back at half time, And um, I was staying with my family at the time and... and they just kind of said, like, oh, have you, have you seen what's happened? You know, have you seen what's going on? And at, at half time, all of the results were going in my favor. And it was just like, I had a real moment of like, wait, this could actually, you know, could, could actually come off. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of chaos around the, the actual, you know, ending, as I'm sure you know. But yeah, that, that was a real, a very stressful run that I was on, I think. The chaos around the ending was incredible. For people who aren't familiar with what happened, what did happen? Yeah, so um, I, I was ahead at half time, and by the time we got to 90 minutes, Kevin De Bruyne had, had just gone and, and scored every goal in the world. And, uh, and the guy who was a, a few places below me going into the week had skyrocketed ahead. And so I, I finished with the second most points. Um, and I, I was pretty happy with that I kind of had not been expecting to get anywhere near the the prizes so it was just kind of like yeah brilliant it's a great story Um, and then I just kind of didn't hear anything for two or three weeks and you know I had kind of um was was moving on and and sort of like uh looking to other things I guess (laughs) and then I just got an email from the Premier League saying that um they'd been disqualified and and that they were gonna um announce me as the champion which was just really unexpected. Did we ever get to the bottom of why that happened? What was the disqualification for? So we, 
we never quite got to the bottom of it. Um, no. So because all that the Premier League have said is that he he broke the terms and conditions. Um, there's a lot of rumours flying around Twitter, and he's he's released a couple of videos which basically says um, he made some comments in a, a private chat which got sent to the Premier League, and they they disqualified him because of those. Um, but yeah, it, it's just a, a bad situation all round. I think. Well, uh, I guess, you know, there has to be uh, somebody who benefits from it and, I guess, you know, finishing in the top two in Fantasy Premier League is still an outrageous achievement, but to win it, obviously, is incredible. Uh, the, the question that everybody wants answered uh, today, Joshua, is how is your Game Week 1 team looking and what is your logical uh, part of your brain telling you ahead of this you season? The, let me get the pen and paper out here first, yeah. going quick, go on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very much not, not decided yet, which is, mm. um, you know, I think... I think I won't be happy with it until the, you know, until the deadlines pass. And even then I might not be happy um, because there's so many choices that feel like very important. You know, do I have um, even just stuff like looking at my midfield, if I've got 14 million to spend on two players, do I go for two that are kind of equally priced or do I get one really expensive player and one really cheap player? And those, you know, I'm trying to break it down to, all of these small decisions, you know, what, what do I want to do about these two particular players where I want them both, but I can only have one. Okay. Like I'll, I'll try and break it down, make that decision and then, and then move on. But the problem is you then end up with a draft and, and I'm just optimizing and optimizing and, and changing it all the time. So yeah, I, I know that there are going to be players that I've had in my draft who I really wish that I'd left in there after week one. Um, because I've had all of the players by now. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the the positional changes obviously is great. It's also really difficult because it has loosened up so many more, like essentially two more forward positions for what might turn out to be probably the cheapest set of forwards we'll ever have going into a game week one of a fantasy Premier League season. Specifically talking here, do you think you're going to go into game week one with Pierre Emerick Aubameyang and Mo Salah? in your team, thereby using up a massive chunk in your budget into midfield positions? Yeah, I, I think I probably will. So when I'm looking at, at those really expensive midfielders, you know, I would love to have all of them. And mm -hmm. I think in many ways, the choice this year is a lot less important than it has been previously, because sure. I think that it's so well balanced. Um, for me, I, I think that the people, probably the three players from that midfield that I expect to be at the top of the, the points list, um, uh, Salah, KDB, and Aubameyang. Um, and I'm, I can't look past Salah and, and Kevin De Bruyne. No, no. Yeah, I, I, I think they're the ones that I'm going to end up going with. But of course, with this um, blank game week one, it all mm -hmm. throws, throws a whole load of other questions out there. That's right. So I think Aubameyang to KDB is going to be a popular move. For sure. Is your, um, your subs bench generally, would, would, would your subs bench be four, 4.5 million players? Do you have some decent players on your bench? Do you, do you like to have the bulk of your, your expense and your budget in that, in that starting 11? Or how do you approach that? Yeah, so I, I want the best of both worlds. Right? I want the cheapest possible players on my bench, but I do want them to get some game time. And I, I don't really mind, even if they're only coming on for half an hour, um, as long as they can get me something. Because if they're coming on, it's because something's gone wrong in my team selection anyway. Um, so I'm just looking for any sort of consolation from that. Mm -hmm. That was quite easy last year because there were players like Lundstrom um, and uh, Den Donker that from the start we knew they were at the bottom of the price range, but they were going to play. Um, Whereas this year, there, there isn't really that. There's, it's a lot harder to find um, bench players so that are actually going to get any points. So I'm, I'm really having a dilemma with it. Of, I don't want to leave any money on my bench, but I, I feel like I'm going to have to. Um, because particularly with coronavirus, I think there might well be players getting quarantined that we're not expecting. That bench might turn out to be a lot more important. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's it's going to be a, a strange all year. Um, I think a lot of people are going to be wildcarding quite early this season as well, not least because of that blank game week one. And as you say, the temptation to go Aubameyang to Kevin De Bruyne after game week one, as you say, to chase those points after Aubameyang may have had an average performance in game week one. A lot of people might avoid that and actually end up going for 
their Manchester players later on after about four or five weeks with a wild card. It's going to be very interesting either way, Joshua. Uh, I wish you the very best with uh, Fantasy Premier League this year. The pressure is slightly Thanks on so you. Uh, set the bar fairly high uh, <laughs> last year. Best of luck with it and we'll chat to you again soon.